thank you all for being here and for being part of this very special event. Uh, I'm Ray Londres. I'm one of the co-curators of this exhibition. And uh, this is the dream, the midnight dream of, of Furile Baez that we've put together um, as part of the new curators program for this year. Um, I am really lucky to call myself a, a new curator. We have a really amazing and generous program uh, that goes through uh, site visits as well as seminars um, uh, and studio visits with artists like Alvaro that we did in the beginning. I am uh, just, just I want to just say that this year we worked with Virale and her team to create a kind of multi-sensory experience across both sides of the South London Gallery, and we were really happy to get closer with her practice, um, but also to work hand in hand with the SLG team, who are so dedicated, so experienced, um, and have just this wealth of knowledge in order to make this a reality. This installation was not easy, um, and I found uh, it to be a really gro a real growth experience to work with both parts of the organization. So I just want to say that to start. Um, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the first public program for this exhibition, um, which is this conversation between Furley and Alvaro Barrington. Uh, I wanted to also just mention that, joy, that this is going to be joined by Michaela and Felix, both of uh, colleagues from the program, but also very close friends. And uh, together, we have just become really enamored with the practices of both of these artists that we've studied for a long, long time since the beginning of this program. And starting with Furle, uh, her work to me creates this kind of very rich tapestry between time and culture and geography. Uh, she was born in the Dominican, but also raised in Miami. And she, I feel, had a very much a lot of flux in her development. Um, she moved homes and schools uh, throughout the years, every single year of high school. And I think she found this kind of solace and respite in the act of creation. Um, and uh, with this was, you know, whether she was making paper dolls as a young child uh, in the Dominican Republic and, and Santiago de los Caballeros or these kinds of illustrious female like figures uh, for her forthcoming show in L.A., um, she kind of brings uh, this, uh, she weaves together both the personal and the collective memory into all of her work. Um, and she works in this kind of wide array of media, as you can tell, painting on aluminum, the installation, uh, drawing, uh, and sculpture most recently as well. Uh, and uh, she kind of creates a, her own contemporary visual language and helps us to reconsider our understanding of history and identity and how to belong in 21st century while looking back at that. Alvaro Barrington similarly brings together references from both his personal and cultural history. He was born in Venezuela, um, but he grew up between Granada and, the, and New York City, and his work encompasses uh, uh, painting and installation. Uh, he has a kind of expansive approach with materials, and he, um, he, he has uh, this, the, the, both of them have this kind of intersection between social history and Caribbean heritage that they showcase in their work. They navigate the complexities of, of a communal immigrant experience, and the work celebrates their both like rich and multifaceted nature of their backgrounds. So currently, Alvaro's work is in the halls of the Duveen Gallery as the Tate's, um, Burden, Tate Burden's commission of this year. And if you have not had the chance to visit, I highly recommend it. It's quite impactful. Um, we're really fortunate to bring these two artists together in conversation. Um, and though their work may originate from different perspectives, they both deeply engage with the concepts of uh, cultural identity and the memory, and they catalyze really compelling reflections on what it means to belong and what it means to remember, but especially what it means to transform. So without further ado, please, wel <laughs> please join me in welcoming Alvaro Barrington and Fairly Bias. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction, Rose. It's really lovely. Thank and you. this is a great full circle moment. The artists that we started with are exhibiting and the first artists that we met on this course. Um, so I think let's start with the basics. So you both identify, you both are painters, but there's been an obvious push in your, both of your practice from canvas to aluminium here, book pages, postcards, steel pans and everything, all the way to immersive installations and structural uh, sculptures as well. If you could discuss that materiality and that push away from the canvas, that would be a great start. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my first forays into sculpture were um, invitations to really engage materially for the viewer. I felt like it was so 
such a lush experience and so lucky that I got to touch the painting. And in museums or institutions, that's something that's never allowed. So um, the tilted wall sculptural installations that reference Sans Souci in Northern Haiti were meant to be almost like an invitation. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Andrea Zetel's Bilbao tour, but she is doing an audio rendition or she's making fun of how sensuous the audio is and she's walking around the building and feeling it and moving. So I wanted, I was drawn to how kids usually engage with sculpture where they'll try to climb it. Um, they'll try to climb and, and own it fully. And I wanted to give that to all the visitors, adults included, for them to be able to approach the painting, get the same level of texture, and just um, break that barrier. Because ultimately, a painting is a sculpture. It is a material in front of you. I like to work usually on canvas because of its history. Mark actually wrote a great essay where he pointed that out, where canvas, cotton specifically, is already so preloaded. Even when you start with a blank surface, you have to contend with the history of cotton and the rectangle, etc. cetera. Um, and many other artists stop there, but um, yeah, just reminding you, you're interacting with materials that allow you to free associate and uh, trip on a safe level, <laughs> imaginatively. And you, Alfred? I think it's hard for me to think about my practice when we're in such an incredible installation. <laughs> and um, um, mostly because this is such a It's hard n not to um, see how these feel, how, how um, I guess it's a sheet, and then the, the cutouts on the top um, forces your body in a different type of way. I don't know if you guys have seen this without the with, without the structure, but it's it's a really high ceiling, and this all of a sudden makes it so much more intimate, and so much more about your ability to sort of um, it just forces your body into something, and I I guess I always when I'm looking at your work I'm so aware of how physical your painting is in terms of you know, spilling pain and throwing pain and using your body as a way of sort of making work. Um, and so for me, it, it, um, it almost is like you're so zoned in when you're making your painting. You're so much, I mean, it's, it's such careful looking, care, careful spilling um, that, that this just feels like a natural extension. It doesn't really feel, you know, it, it, yeah, it feels like, uh, of course, you're going to have this roof above us. I think maybe that's quite a good point to go on to about, so your technique that you often use is to pour. So you will quite often have the aluminiums or the canvases on the floor, and you'll pour and respond to the way that the paint pulls and the way it moves. And Alvaro as well, I, I was reading an article recently and how you work, obviously, when you're painting, you realize something very different when you forced to paint directly on the tube to the canvas and it dropped. And so that kind of responsive way of working, which you could expand on that technique and, yeah, responding to the, the history of canvas or the history of the building or the history of the material would be great to expand on. So that can lead us into an academic rabbit hole. <laughs> and I think it would be juicier to perhaps yeah. go into uh, the presence and like experience and sensation. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, if anything, a place for viewers to free associate. I have particular <coughs> memories that when you mentioned 
the sheet, I immediately thought of my grandmother's mosquito nets and yeah. like how this also had that, a similar shape. And for me, I had always associated this mostly with the tarpaulins, like after a hurricane. Um, so it's always trying to evoke an experience more than anything. Like this, the material is a marker for other things as much as it is its own self. It's always, yeah, a portal more than anything. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I think one of, one of the things that's so, like, like I'm a huge hip hop fan, so I always think of like, you know, hip hop needed um, the sound system from Jamaica in order, and then you needed like the Puerto Ricans and all the folks and and you needed like all of it for it to come together because they're pulling from a different um, inf in internal information. Like if you ever go to Jamaica, you go, oh, I get why the sound system came from here. I get why reggae came from here. It's like in the texture of the air. It's like so much in your, like really the texture creates the sound that reggae came out of. And I, I think, you know, there's so much of a, um, similar in here, there's so much of like, a memory of like, you know, there, the, the Caribbean is sort of weird because it's, it's so mountainous and all, you're always covered somehow. There isn't really like, you know, whether it's sheets or, you know, so I think, I mean, even in my show at the Tate, I had to cut the roof off because it was like, you, you just, you're running through the forest, you're running through the, you know, it's just not, it's not LA where there's nothing but sky. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no like prairie, but I did no. love how the, the soundscape in your show it just seeped into you, and then the tin roof, the corrugated roof, really affected that. I completely, yeah, was transported back into experiencing that same thing. And one of the first memories I had, too, was my grandmother. There was this massive hurricane called David that decimated, uh, like, a whole generation in the 70s. And my grandmother would tell us how tin roofs were the most violent thing, because they would just fly in there and decapitate people yeah. if you were outside. So this association of like the coziness of a rainstorm and hitting the roof, yeah. it's one of my most uh, peaceful sounds. And then thinking of like the violence of that as a free agent in the wind, mm -hmm. that it can exist as both. Mm -hmm. It's pretty intense. And then doing these metal things that were <laughs> meant to also be running away and free and active and agent have agency, but uh, that the, it came with like the knife's edge of the trickster being able to be follow many paths and also stabbing my feet while I was painting them <laughs> while doing the pour. Do you feel then with uh, referring to the hurricane top here, the tin roof, the use of aluminium, that these things that are very much about disaster or about the kind of precipice of danger that through your artistic processes are kind of become something that are more akin to healing and to uh, safety? I'm not sure. I remember seeing a lot of Rauschenberg works when he, after he moved to Captiva, he just had like yeah. fly, like all the debris after a storm would come through, including metal signs and corrugated uh, metal. Um, and I don't think for him it ever became a thing of healing. It was more a marker of space and time and how, uh, the act of making is sometimes just an archaeological dig or you're a witness. I myself personally do like to think of um, you guys out here in England call it respite, respite, mm -hmm. but we say respite. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so and so bizarre, but either way, either pronunciation, a place for you to pause and uh, find yourself again, I tend to be 
overly sensitive, especially around big crowds. And so to find a place that I can give to others to come back in is always, is always a, a gift. It's always something I'm interested in. In a similar way to um, your process of drawing and referencing back to music, I think, Farrella, you have a really beautiful process of drawing from things such as myth mythology in your work and throw out these pieces as well as the pieces in the fire station. The Saguapa makes a recurring um, <coughs> presence throughout. And I'm wondering your relationship to mythology now, including and also outside of the Saguapa character. So I was always taught of mythology as psychic guards. Like they're the things that communities build to tell you how to behave normatively and then give you the understory for how to escape it. Mm -hmm. It's like the escape valves within a certain culture. Um, so I'm always fascinated by how different societies construct them. And then the overlaps and the lack of overlap because they are in themselves row sharks that reveal so much. Mm -hmm. um, so in working with this trickster figure, the Siguapa from Hispaniola, which is shared by DR and Haiti, it's revealing not so much, I guess over time, it hasn't been so much for the normative telling of the figure, but for what it reveals from of the space I'm in. And then also what other spaces, when I show them, will reflect back. Mm -hmm. uh, so like Utah or Denmark or anywhere else in the world, how what is being reflected back is also fascinating. And I know this, but I'm sure it will be um, useful for the audience to know as well, your first encounter with the Saguapa figure. So resistant, because I feel like I say it too many times, but it, it was like, a, I'm not sure how many of you have the experience of having to get your hair combed and detangled and like, especially with curly hair, you're just like, have to have a practice on having a, a strong neck and no tears. And so, and the endurance the of that, of like just being like, hold tight, this will end, you know, but you have to get your hair braided because you can't be running around. There's an interesting phrase, you're gonna turn into a guaraguao, which as an adult, I understand it's a red-tailed hawk, which mm -hmm. is a gnat, the bird of Dominican Republic, or one of the birds. I'm like, why do I not want to be a hawk? Why do I not want to be free in the sky? But like this idea that normative braiding, that uh, certain control, containment of yourself, your body uh, was needed to navigate the world and be accepted. So as they were combing my hair and pulling and yanking, they would say, tell me the story of this feral creature from the forest who, um, had this incredible agency whose feet were backwards, so she was traceless, uh, who had this lustrous mane of hair, unlike mine. So then it meant that I could project onto her. I could see, you know, what is lustrous mane? Would it be a pelted fur? What is it to have a woman's body covered in hair? There are these incredible wood carvings from Germany of uh, the Hirsute Magdalene, they're just these Magdalene sculptures that are just full on Yeti. And they're the most delicate hair carvings ever. Um, and they're meant to be parallels to John the Baptist going to the desert and, you know, being covered in hair, his, all his hair growing wild. But that Mary Magdalene, a female figure within the Bible, could have access to such spirituality that her, her, her body would be transformed. And there are very few spaces within normative Christianity to think of the female body having like that slippage. And incidentally, these sculptures were being done right when women were being hunted and like hundreds of thousands, no, tens of thousands were being murdered for village. So how do you, how does a society build that and do that at the same time? Mm -hmm. And coming from DR where there are, the aesthetics of that space have affected and rippled throughout is always fascinating. Like the Kardashians are affected by Dominican aesthetics. It's ridiculous. No, it's true. I think it's always, I mean, one of the, one of my kind of interesting projects is like how these small islands 
um, in the Caribbean Sea has impacted globally the idea of how we understand our bodies. But what's really interesting, and I kind of I remember listening to, um, including like, there's, there is a direct correlation between DR, you know, in, in New York, if a girl said, oh, I'm going to DR, you kind of knew what that meant. <laughs> it meant she was coming back with a different body. Yeah, yeah, she was just, <laughs> it was, and I, I was thinking about that today, how insane it is for a caterpillar to go through the chrysalis, that they literally qu liquefy themselves and become new. Mm -hmm. And the terror that it is, like people go there fully knowing that there's no natural, there's no regular power grid so you are very much risking your life mm -hmm. for the pressure of, of looking a certain way. Yeah, when Cardi, Cardi's like, I don't know what's in my body. You know, when she's, <laughs> when she's talking about, you know, getting... Yeah, getting, she's like, it just looks good. We'll deal with the contingencies later. Yeah. But yeah. No, there's a, it's, it's really fascinating because... Um, because it's, 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 it's really interesting because I, I listened to a podcast, I mean, an interview you did once, and, um, and I happened to have been reading this Audre Lorde, um, the poetry is not a luxury, and she talks about how much, um, and Gleason also kind of mentions it, he talks about how much um, the body of black and brown people hold all our ancestors trauma all our joys all of it but because it's not like recorded history you kind of discover it as you're making something as you're making a work or making or writing up that poetry isn't about words it's about the discovery of your of yeah of how you're connecting and i was just really curious about um because we have a similar education we a little bit. We went to the same university. Um, we maybe have some of the same. Um, we grew up in the era of Carol Walker, of Alan Gallagher, of when Gucci Mutu. Yeah. You know, and for us, I think in the UK, it's a very different. Edu it was a very different time for you guys because you're maybe the YBA era, but for um, for us, it's like, what, Kara? Did you see what she did? You know, so I think there's... What Julie Moretti did. What yeah. Julie did. Yeah. So. It, is, it, it is interesting how, how many incredible women painters there were in that generation, that they were, like, um, we would look across and see Jenny Seville, but we had, like, a whole plethora of strong painters out there. Um, in, in that sense, I guess like it was a kind of hegemony of Yale <laughs> and <laughs> maybe a certain aesthetic coming from that, yeah. but that they, because they were so different from a lot of the notes coming through, they sustained. Um, so I, I was looking at them, but at the same time that I was going to Cooper, even though they were the preeminent voices, you know, sometimes education in universities is almost like a, a bit back from that. So in school, yeah. they were very much about abstraction. Yeah. No figuration allowed. Like, you know, if you brought anything that was specific and of your history or identity, you had to sustain like a full flaying, a public flaying. And so getting really good at abstraction and trying to speak backwards, dance backwards, and like tell people, this is what I love and care about. Um, and so when I got out of undergrad, it was like free for all. I, w I just wanted to do all the figuration I could. And it was that push that maybe got us to, like, uh, I'm, I wasn't alone in that, that push for wanting to be as specific as possible mm -hmm. that got us into the figurative space we are now. And now we're like, okay, that's enough more abstraction. But how things seesaw, experiencing that, being part of those same waves of 
you know, what is allowed in an institution versus what is being celebrated by culture at the moment can be completely different. Do you think there's a there's been a shift in that? Oh, absolutely. Now I think that there is almost like the the same whiplash that happened then for figuration is I feel like there's a pressure now to go into more abstracted spaces. And as politics get more and more you know, there's a correlation between vampire movies and zombie movies and what who's in power mm. in the, you know, versus uh, liberal or Democrat or uh, conservative. Mm. And it's funny to think of how maybe that's also correlated between figuration and abstraction. Mm. What, what studies are around that? I mean, I think, I don't know. I, I, I get into this. I mean, because... So in New York, there is like a heavy indoctrination in the Northeast school about um, the power of abstraction. But I think of abstraction, and I've said this many, many, many times, in the ab X type of way, as particularly a, a, a Jewish movement post-Holocaust. Post, uh, it is like... How do we, if you're Mark Rotko, how do you experience the Holocaust? You go, you listen to some jazz musicians. You see a bunch of black people who are doing jazz in a crowd of every race. And you go, wow, how do I make this artwork? How do I do this? And, and so Rotko is just like, no matter if you're Jewish or black or whatever, you are looking at the same red blob on top of another red blob, and maybe you could meet at a place of familiarity. You could also declare that you have a body by spilling paint, but yeah. And that's the most radical gesture you could do as a, a community that saw your, saw the world already to extinct your whole population. And so I always think of abstraction as very particular in a very particular type of moment. But I think everything is an abstraction, is an interpretation. I mean, this is a sky in DR, but it's so fucking cleverly done. I mean, really, it's like I would have never thought of bed sheets <laughs> and, and the feeling it gives you in a London sky to give me this sort of feeling. And that comes in your ability to internalize that and then put it out and for us to feel it. But that's an abstraction. Fully, fully, yeah. I think uh, that was the benefit of not being allowed to be figurative in, in school, that it allowed you to fully explore materials and what things said in themselves. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm which is something we spoke of before. How do, you, how do you lead the viewer to experience something and not tell them mm. what to do mm. in that experience? Um, and that's the nuance that abstraction can give. I always, even in these, I mentioned before how <coughs> one thing I love, and I, I wish I had been taught about Frank Bowling's work when I was in school, and, and all that education about it, abstraction, no one ever mentioned his name and mm. how many of the things that I was making were so similar, like zero conversation around that. But that part of that kind of abstraction is that it becomes a reservoir for an environment. It's dependent on the architecture, it's depending on the environment, on everything. So like these, if you get close, you see Bruton, you see Somerset, they become archives of mm. the flora and fauna and everything, all the cats walking over the painting, <laughs> the sunset insects being like, all oh, right, we're gonna come in here and say, and like the mm. trees shedding their flowers, everything is embedded into the painting. Mm. And those things, I say like nature is the best painter. There are things that come out of releasing control that are far more nuanced than what I can do with a pictorial hand. Mm. And I love that. Mm. It's almost like a collaborative project between you and nature. Yeah. 
Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking a lot about the process of active looking. And I think it's so easy to do this, especially with this exhibition, because you come in and there are so many elements that are part of it. There's the sound element, there's the visual element, because there are so many layers in each of the pieces. And I'm wondering what active looking looks like for both of you now, especially in a world where like it's so easy to get overwhelmed and like there's so much going on um, socially, economically, politically. Yeah, I'm just wondering what active looking looks like and what it means for you currently. I think, um, today is extremely difficult to look. You know, I think there is a, a really, um, especially in the art world, an incredibly violent set of groupthink, you know, and I think in terms of um, it was really in terms of like what is allowed to be exercised in this moment. I always think like art is really about just exercising your truth. It's not really about like me agreeing with it politically or whatever. It's just like, man, you know, you're telling me how you see the world. And I think today there's a bit of um, intellectual laziness that comes with like Thinking there's like a lot. I mean, this happened in art school a lot. Where I remember um, the head of the prof university was like, people treat art as like you walk up into the you walk to the artwork, and it's not really about looking at how the artists see the world. It's usually about like, oh, I have a certain agenda, and I'm going to project that agenda onto the work. And I remember there's this story I always tell all the time about Carrie James Marshall who always used to say, I don't want my painting to be some fucking free zone association. Meaning that when you walk up to that Carrie James Marshall painting, if it's two black couples dancing, he wants you to go, this is a black couple dancing. He doesn't want you to go, oh, what about Chicago violence? Yeah. Right? It, and, and let's talk about violence in Chicago and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, in front of you is two black couples dancing. That's what you need to look at. That's what you need to see. And I think there's so many different ways in which people are projecting. But that's not something, you know, I even give very specific titling to give you a doorway to say, hey, these are specific thoughts you can have while looking at the work. But that free for all, that's on the viewer. Yeah. That's what Roberta Smith said when once when she completely missed my painting. She was like, you don't own the meaning, Alvaro. I was like, you're right. <laughs> I don't. We don't own the meaning of the work. So it's a bit of a tension between. Yeah. It's like, I, I, I give you poetry. Read it back as poetry. It'd be great. Open up doors. But I, it's always going to be, I always call it like performing a public autopsy and having an agenda for what you want to find in that body. Like, you don't give me poetry, give me whimsy, give me anything but a didactic execution. You know, like if you're, if you're seeing someone and you're already coming in with presumptions, that doesn't necessarily just limit your experience of them, but your experience of yourself. Yeah. Like how mm -hmm. open do you want to be as a human? How many worlds do you want to see? And um, there's always a potential. And as an artist, I'm giving that, after that, you know, it's on the viewer. Yeah. I mean, and this is one of my, like, you know, I really uh, think listening, looking is so critical right now. I think we're, like, in the age of Twitter, in the age of Instagram, about having um, immediately really strong emotional feelings after maybe a 10 second tweet 
You know, it's like you look at a tweet and you're like, oh my God, you know, I remember this is, and, and, and what you've done here is ask people to slow down. Um, you've dimmed the light so that their eyes have to take time to adjust to, it's almost like, you know, I mean, this, this feels very familiar, familiar to like Chris Ophelia's new museum show when he had that blue room and I said, fuck Chris. Right, the nighttime paintings, oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Yes. There was a, I always say, there's a pre Chris Ophelia New York. Uh, and a, there is, and you know what? Before Chris's show, there had been other wallpaper shows, that fourth floor, where he put that really like dreamy blue purple walls yeah. and then the paintings on top. Urs Fisher had done a show where he had put in a wallpaper, a vinyl of every previous show before him. <laughs> and then it was such a kind of like put on push gesture that no one noticed it. But if you just go in with that like love, it felt like just so full. It felt like fully engaging the senses and I I think that's why everybody was so impacted in New York by it. Everyone else wanted to do it, and we're still doing our paper version. shows. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. <sighs> what is that now? Like ten years later? Yeah, it's madness. But although I think Lord Owens did a probably the best version of a wallpaper show yeah. at Van Gogh Museum. I had, I didn't get to do that. It was really great. Yeah. <laughs> You're just doing like flowers on Mark's feet all the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that yes. was a show. <laughs> Yes. But yes, she is superb. But that was after Chris. Yeah, there was like, I mean, I think what was really, what's really interesting for me being here is and having people experience the show because I think it's really a synthesis of like a very deeply, and I'm, I'm only saying this as an American, um, a synthesis of so much of that art education as an American over here, as a Dominican or, you know, somebody who's getting an education in that area of the world, because there's so, over here, there, there are so many brilliant artists who kind of infected the ideas of making. I think what's so brilliant about, and actually quite contra contradict, uh, con like on the opposite end is that so much of the artwork in the UK is about um, this sort of goldsmith sort of criticality and so much of the work coming out of our generation is about the body and about and, and there were certain sorry there were certain sculpture professors that were influencing that like Corporality. Everybody had to be the body. Everything had to be kind of like uh, it, it swung the the range from like a McCarthy like, you know, I will put poop on the table to like just <laughs> to a, a full like uh, I will the you know through the mind experience the body like just full range of senses and. It might have, in that reach for body, it was also a bit more earnest. I think work there became more earnest. We're here, it's still a bit okay to be ironic. Um, but that mark making is a one bridge. There's like a kind of like, you know, butter way of applying things. It's kind of like just very sensory. That's a bridge. Yeah, but and it's really interesting because I think what makes this show such because I think your work is such a incredible synthesis of all of those artists, right? Like I don't know if we would get to your cutout without Kara Walker, oh, yeah. right? And um, over here, I think what's interesting in the YBAs, whenever I'm teaching, the two artists that gets mentioned the most is uh, Tracy and Sarah Lucas. Like, and both of those are women who've done, dealt with the body. But remember again, like your references are f founded by who's teaching you. Mm. And that those are your first like, almost like uh, tracks that are burrowed into your brain of, yeah, of yeah. what you access in the world. Yeah. And whether you choose to expand from that or not, those are the people that you're they probably knew those were their friends or who they went to school with or who they aspired 
whose practices they loved, you know, so it's all, I also say that mariquitas, the little paper dolls affected these, like, you know, yeah, yeah. things in space, being able to um, move. There's a, a Dominican doll that is usually like kind of a 3D cutout and you bang on a table to make it move around the space. So this idea of like a sonic waves affecting the body were uh -huh. already kind of like a, a simple lesson taught as a childhood game. And now we have things like there's always a video of someone taking the their partner's phone and being like spas world experiences blah 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 to try to train the algorithm on what they want to do or for them to try to do for them so this understanding that our sound is being monetized and captured not just our daily experiences and that there are visualizing technologies i'm sorry for the echo guys there there are ways of visualizing the world around us that are sometimes outside of our control but that we could also act back on like that is a a, a joke but it's a full rebellion to be like i see you looking i look back and i will want you to do these things my way um but yeah that we can in a way this is an act of, of that of returning all of that back As you were speaking, I was thinking about um, the theme of spectatorship that you explore quite a lot as well. And you've been working with uh, archival book pages for a while in this, in this particular exhibition. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see the work in the fire station, um, there's a room full of these really beautifully painted book pages. And at the very bottom of two, two of them, there are these really delicately painted eyes um, to prompt people to think about how we essentially live in like a panopticon state where everybody's looking, everybody's watching, everyone's often looking and perceiving other people through another layer or through somebody else's eyes. Um, and I'm wondering how that's affected your ability to make um, as of recent as well, or whether it has had an impact on you at all. Because making is a zone outside of that for me, mm -hmm. it is, I'm sure it has affected it. I think it would be disingenuous for me to say, oh yeah, I'm not affected by the gram. I'm not affected by social media or by all these different developments that are like a whirlwind around, but it does give me an emotional, spiritual break from it um with a full understanding like part of the book pages so it's a way of exploring histories it's a way of exploring all those forces and the counter forces in that but all that is like uh icing on the structure which is just the viewer's engagement the kind of capturing their viewer's breath and like transforming this material so a baseline, all my mark making, all the things that draw you in are just free associating, beautiful icing to really like, just like break it down. Mm -hmm. Really hopefully make the viewer understand that there are heroic gestures, but that our daily lives, our, our minutest gesture is constantly changing the world around us mm -hmm. um and part of the exhaustion now is that we think how in the hell am i going to change this world when it seems to just be falling apart mm -hmm. what grand gesture who's going to be my hero who's going to be the person who like is able to change any of the things that are around me but the fact is that every action we take is cumulative and is changing everything around us. Mm. Um, it's a big one, but mm. so those eyes are just, it's also just like painting, like getting to be, to revel in this thing. Like how crazy is it? Like reading in itself is a crazy gesture. You know, we're actively hallucinating to mm. wood, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that to depict something in a way that makes someone feel like it's an actual object, trompe l'oeil on its own is so fun to do. Mm -hmm. Like if you get the shadow just right, 
you know, you go back to that thing of like trying to grab something, to be drawn in, um, and to show the limits of, of perception, mm -hmm. the limits of like, then in that desire to capture and hold, you're like, oh wait, there's a limit to what I see. Mm -hmm. And that that's really fun to work on and with. I suppose in many ways it's almost like time traveling or like texture traveling as well. There's something before I, I mean, this is a little bit off to topic, but there's two things that I just randomly thought about. But I, what, the first one, I mean, obviously is like the brilliance of Should I say this first? I think what I love when I'm listening to you is that you give so much value to um, the fact that you are cutting out a paper doll, a paper, um, you have a word, name for it, but Marikita, and that somehow that equally allow, is in, incredibly valuable today as it was when you were doing it younger, at a younger age. And I think what's really amazing about your practice is that you know, you're know you giving values to so many ways of making. And I think that becomes really challenged because as adults, you're always told that somehow there's, you're almost, being out of like the value as a kid that you had when you were making it's like almost becomes immature and you like have consistently when you talk about making talk about how much as a teenager it was valuable as a kid it was valuable and that how much it, it continues to inform what you're making today as well as like oh going to college and but but I think so many people kind of walk into art thinking, okay, the only time art becomes art is like if it's a painting on a canvas. Yeah, that's a false art, for sure. I think that that when we talked about barriers and like uh, people feeling like they couldn't access or, or the agendas you spoke of, like part of creating those hierarchies come from language and from um, making, like locking doors for people to come in. And, and, you know, every time we have to do the didactics for an exhibition, museums have a certain age range. They're like, we have to stop at a 13 year old reading level or we have to have a sixth grade reading level. What would that be, level six here? You've been in here for a long time. <laughs> But anyhow, yeah. like they're like, it has to be accessible to this audience. And then um, just understanding that like at any level, there are ways of structuring language that you feel like you're opening and not closing the reading of a work. Um, and it's really tricky to do. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, I feel like this is such a great joy because it's, you know, there was so much about kind of reduction, reduction, reduction. And then that's when you get like, I think, the Twitters and the Instagram because it's so much about, yeah. You know, I always think of Instagram as like the kids who weren't allowed at the party, but saw the images that somebody photographed the next day. And then they said, oh, I, I got the idea. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I was at the parties. I'm like, I wasn't taking photographs. I was I doing, I was, yeah, yeah. yeah, I wasn't, I was having a good time. So <laughs> please hide that photo. And, um, and then it becomes like, um, I saw this video once of like, actually not even, I went on a day once. And um, this is a long time ago. And we just sat there and we had nothing to say to each other. And she would photograph it once in a while. And, and um, I was like, oh my God, that was such a horrible date. I don't know if we'll ever talk. And then I saw my name tagged on Instagram. And I looked and I said, oh my God, it was so fun. <laughs> it was like the best date. 
It was like, huh? how did that make you feel? So I was like, wow. For reality. <laughs> yeah, but we had like, if you watch the whole thing, we just sat there next to each other, like, uh, and I looked at IG and I was like, wow, you know, and I think what you're doing is asking us to have an experience again and not be an image yeah because i think culture is asking us to be an image yeah yeah and part of it is like not just an image but an image that fits within a certain frame yeah and so you can like veer off of that you can't like you know you're yeah a lot of people harshing on people's <laughs> you know experience and 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 i always like to think how freeing it was to grow up partially without any media at all. Like we would go to my grandmother's house in the countryside and there would be no television. So we'd have to create the games. We would have to create, like fully engage our senses and be terrified by the sounds of toads as we walked by ponds. Be like, you know, the, the things that were uh, fully activating us were just in the environment. And all of that is in here. All of it, so hopefully, you know? No, it is. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think if you didn't, this is, I don't think if you didn't have those experiences, this work would happen. You think so? I don't know. Yeah, because I don't think you could live, you, you could always tell the kid who wasn't at the party. Because they would have the most generic story. Be like, yeah, I remember that happened. Be like, it's like 40-year-old virgin when he was like, yeah, tell us about what sex was, and he's like, yeah, it's like sandbags. You know, it's like, okay. So, you know, you just kind of <laughs> go, oh, yeah. Yeah. You weren't at the party. Oh, yeah. And this is, you're at the party. This is the party, yeah. This is the party. I think this is also a party that encourages you to slow down, though, which I find quite beautiful. So yesterday, um, when we opened, I saw a little boy in here earlier and in the morning, and he was just like running and following the light on the floor, I love that. which I thought was so, so beautiful. And it was also making me think about um, your ability to encourage people um, to re to refer back to literature such as um, the Ben, ben Oakery novel that you painted. And I know in the past you've referred to authors like Octavia Butler as well, um, which, I actually read one of her one of her novels for the first time this year, *Parable of the Sower*, um, and it was so fitting because obviously it begins in the year twenty twenty four as well. Um, I'm really curious about what literature um, you're currently reading um, and how that's currently impacting on your work. So there's it's it's very meandering. There's a lot of like essays and poems and different books, um, but the two authors you mentioned, the reason I was drawn to the, those particular novels were was more for like how myths are usually structured, um, that they're telling one story on the overarching novel, and then through this, the cracks in between, you read their, the, another novel. Mm -hmm. And how for Octavia Butler, so many times, there is this chaos actively being described. It was a very, like MAGA as we're actively unfolding in the present um, and people being like, this is far-fetched, this could never happen. But she was just referencing Nixon and Reagan. Like those were slogans from then and seeing into the future, she called herself, she said she had a radio mind. Um, so noticing and being able to project forward. And in that, full social collapse, she was basically saying, we need to, before facing any battle, we need to rest, we need to take care of each other, we need to form community, because unless we do that, we won't survive. Like, we might win the battle, but we won't survive it. We won't win to live another day and to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so in that uh, Famish Road, Ben Alkari novel that I had at the figure reading, there are these moments <coughs> of magical realism that are that escape valve throughout a very like heartfelt like intense novel it's a bit like edward jantikat's crick crack um which we had been thinking about as well where like she is giving you 
such ephemeral moments but if you don't catch them all you're left with is like this incredible heaviness mm -hmm. i made the mistake of having my sister who was working in icu wards the whole time of the pandemic i was like sis there's this great author octavia butler it's just like what's happening right now she was fully traumatized because she couldn't she didn't have the bandwidth at that time to understand like oh yeah here are the moments in the novel where the author is constantly telling the the group the main protagonist like stop pause step back you you're this close but step back because you won't make it as a whole um and so i i'm still trying to convince her that they're lovely but for her it was too much so how do we create moments for seeing and appreciating those. And so that's why the figure in the painting is, has the book open to that specific part of the novel where I want the viewer, if they open it up and see um, how open and glorious that imaginary can be. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, do you? No, I, sorry, I was just, it's hard to, for me to think sometimes about, I was just thinking about like, because you mentioned Octavia Butler and the violence of that time. And maybe because I was thinking about Kara and the violence of her, that she, um, as a black American, I, which I think we are, we're, we're not black Americans. Yeah, that's thing. I think black Americans, and neither is Jean Michelle Basquiat, you know, we have a certain type of, I don't want to say protection. There's an expansion for There's sure. A, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I now retroactively, they're trying to make everyone Caribbean. So they're like, Biggie was this. Well, Biggie was or, Caribbean. He was, but he was he born there? Like, that's the thing. No, nah, he went back to, oh, oh but he come will go on, back let's and, do that. No, 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 for sure. I, I fully own that. I am okay. like, yes, they're all Caribbean. But there was okay. a... a what part of what you're saying is that they had this harsh divide of being like, to belong, you have to erase all the things that are outside of this yes. to be fully black American. And right now, even we have conversations of like, Martinique had more captured Africans than the entirety of the United States before the independence. Like there are certain Caribbean islands that had more people, higher attrition. Like they're, as much as you're saying we have a protection because we have, uh, it's different though. Protection of being a majority. Yes. So like Harry yes. Balafonte, But there's Sydney a fuckery Portier. of DR. There's a certain, yeah. um, there is a certain psychic violence that being Dominican enacts yeah. on its people. And it's because of its being adjacent to the first black republic. Yeah. Like, I'm constantly talking about to with my sister on that, like how how is the Dominican Republic either complicit or not in ignoring the the chaos next door? Like she was just telling me, like if people because we're still the Caribbean as a whole is being uh, controlled by like Monroe Doctrine, yeah. export import laws, like we don't have agency that. The archipelago doesn't have agency over its own economy. Um, all the way back from like Haiti having, you know, reparations, like 60 billion. Yeah. If, if the noise is next door, they won't notice what's happening there. So then like all the self erasure, all the uh, double speak that happens, you know, all the ignoring of self, that's, I always thought like, why would they not want to have full stability? Like, but yeah, she was calling me recently on that. There's a, uh, uh, this is sort of a very odd kind of thing, but there's like a, in the States, there are, so if you're Puerto Rican, I remember reading a long, a story a long, long time ago, but it's like if you, there's um, hierarchies of who gets to immigrate if you're, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or Dominican. And and because DR is tied to Haiti. It's like. Uh, it's like a ch -ch -ch. So, um, and then Puerto Ricans are a commonwealth. So they're like, technically you could immigrate and then 
be part of. And then Cuba, you could immigrate because you're you're against communism or Fidel Castro, but that there's active and now Venezuelans because of our long history. <laughs> Have they actually opened it up? Because I remember it's like if the U.S. is actively, or to my understanding, if they were actively intervening into a certain space, like when they were against the Contra, the Nicaraguans could come in. Yeah. If they were past that, they were taking their military back, then it's like that's the, that's the end of it. So now that Cuba is opening up its economy, they're actually somewhat limiting immigra immigration from there. And part of the, you know, Puerto Ricans have a certain freedom to come back and forth, but it comes at a certain cost. So yeah. like a lot of tech bros moved to PR when uh, the pandemic happened, but, and mainland Americans could go to the island and get like a 20 year tax abatement. So you could buy properties in mass and get a relief from buying, but the same largesse would not be given to people who are in the island actively. So, um, or like all the, after the Hurricane Maria, all the other Caribbean islands wanted to give aid. They had shiploads ready, but because the, again, the monetary, the, the laws are so arcane, they prioritized, the U.S. blocked all aid until they could get it from Hawaii to Puerto Rico. Um, so it's, it's just the farthest possible. The furthest and, and like least carbon neutral way of getting anything there. But it served their purposes, the politics, their markets. There were, you know, there are so many things that are just at base inefficient, but also just like, I don't know. Yeah. Mm, definitely agreed. Um, in a space that's immersive as this um, and where time feels like it's nothing like a social construct. I'm really sorry to have to um, slowly wrap up <laughs> and open this up to um, any audience questions that we might have for Alvaro and for Friulele. One of my former students is over there and should ask a question. Oh, no. I said, you got to come. And somebody else over here should ask a question. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to embarrass too many people here. <laughs> yeah, respect to, to, to all of you for leading this wonderful combo. Uh, this question is primarily for Fidele. Um, you know, in the firehouse, you have this video, and you and you you mention uh, your art practice being in conversation with, or rather, against technology, uh, which I think is really interesting in many ways. And, um, you know, for me growing up as an Afro-Brazilian, um, looking at the ways that the Quilombos or that this history of Maroon um, creating uh, and uh, building of, of space, of ideas, of culture, um, looking at that as a technology, right? And um, seeing the ways that, that in this case, black people, when they are taking their um, their independence, um, seeing the ways that that materializes in space, um, and and seeing that in those times when Black folks have you know been in that transitory transitional space of reclaiming, um, seeing the ways that those physical spaces look and feel, and even thinking about how that carries into today, you know, thinking about. Um, my family's house is built out of found objects in, in, in Bahia. And, and um, seeing that carried legacy once again of, um, of you know, building new worlds, new opportunities to, to be in conversation with the natural world as well. Um, thinking about the ways that this room is going against so many technologies, right? Whether that's the technology of the traditional art space um, or if that's the technology of, uh, you know, the rectangular room. You, you mentioned the, the history of the canvas. Um, and you also mentioned the importance of your work and, uh, or the intention of your work grounding the body in space. Um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about thinking about these legacies of, 
you know, in my case, I think of it as quilombismo. And I'm thinking of, you know, Paulo Freire talking about the oppressed people being the, the ones who are, the only ones who are able to liberate the minds of a, of a oppressive society. Um, thinking about carrying all of those legacies in um, building space. Um, yeah, like as you were creating this, particularly in this room, um, how was that moving through you, if it was at all? Yeah, thanks for that question. So I think it's almost inevitable. I am actually not a technophobe. I'm not against technology. I'm against the limits of technology because we are the ghost in the machine. The black body is embedded within structures of if you think I, I there's this video that is so horrific going around of this grafted skin cells over a robot's face and it's like the robot smiling with human skin cells grown in a lab and how the foundation of so much lab work of all the cells being grown is a black woman's body the gila cell is a baseline the most normative cell in, in, in all biotech. So then going back into stories of enslavement and people being caught eating the sugar cane and being punished for that. But then to understand, like, you know, then stories being written down of the person speaking back. How can you say I don't own this if my children were given to this, if my blood was given to this? So it's, we cannot separate the two. The, the normative work hours are based on Caribbean uh, code noir, what's acceptable to keep a human working. Um, so breaking that down, acknowledging that, and realizing we have the potential to build tech that is so much more luscious and expansive and generous to a, to us like like you mentioned this is a technology for opening your mind there is and i think this is probably now fully incorporated into a lot of the objects we engage with but i remember perhaps in the early to mid 2000s there being this like several splashy articles about echolocation as a new sound tech where you could recreate a space you could recreate a room by pointing a mic at the inside of a potato chip bag and how the echo of that give you a fully visible, like, you know, full visibility into something. And it allowed my mind to free associate into, wouldn't it be wonderful if this technology was developed so fully that we could amplify an amphora and go back into the maker studio? Like if we had, tech has so much potential but it also, under the wrong filter, under a narrowed frame, can be repeating the horrors of the Congo, which we are at the moment. They are just acknowledging we uh, can do so much better than that at baseline. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. I think also, I mean, just sort of piggybacking on both what we're experiencing and what you said, and a conversation I had with, um, my homie Soul and Dynasty, they're like, yeah, do rag is technology. And I think we have um privilege technology that comes all that all that that's armor. Yeah. All of those are technology. And I think we sort of have gotten to a point where we privilege value. Like Twitter somebody said to me once, Twitter could only have been invented by a male because only men communicate like that. And I think we only we've created a world where the value of a, only a specific group of we think of technology as only belonging to Silicon Valley and and not necessarily to any all of this. And I always feel like your work. I mean, the fact that this is, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Hello. 
Um, Firle, I just had the amazing opportunity to see your show in Denmark a couple months ago. And I know as well you've just opened a major show in Boston. Um, I'm just wondering for both of you, how do you think about localizing your work? Or do you think about audiences and places that you're going to be presenting kind of major institutional shows? And what does it mean to be showing a, a large installation for both of you right now in London in the summer of 2024? Um, I guess for me, the Tate Britain is so specific. You know, it's like, um, I'm not quite British, but for, I grew up in Grenada, my mom's Grenadian, my grandma's Grenadian. I've been here for a decade. So basically nearly half my life, uh, the, the king and the queen has been my head of state. And, um, um, so it, it sort of forced me to think about that think about my mom, my grandma, who would have sent, who died essentially as the king and queen as their head of state. And so um, that was specific because I had to think about also, I mean, the Windrush and all the other Caribbean folks who have been here and maybe make a installation that allowed that also allowed like the fact that I think of myself as a working class immigrant and class is a much larger conversation here than it is in the US. So the idea of a plastic covered furniture, if you're like an Irish immigrant or in the Midlands, you probably had those same things. Um, that there's a surgeon show happening, surgeon in fashion. Um, there was also a really funny that sometimes it could be extremely conservative. There was also like a really fun. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, there was just a funny article by someone and I was going to like clap back, but I said, fuck it. But they basically they're like a feminist, but they basically started the article by like talking about my sister's ass, which was really like such a wild way of like it was really weird i just thought it was funny though yeah i was like i was like all right speaking of that sculpture it was torture to not be able to play the drums we're gonna fix that okay okay because the soundtrack would come in and you're like i could be doing that yeah i could be trying at least to do that but yeah, yeah. yeah. um so specificity, there's only so much you can control of that. I think sometimes I will try to do very site specific murals. So for Boston and for Denmark, I did one of both and to engage with their history through documents or maps. Um, but, you know, included in those were surveys of works that I had done so long ago. And for me, each work evokes a specific architecture. I can remember the season and the light and, you know, the floor, whatever I was working in. Um, and all I can hope is that some of the feeling that activated the making of that can be present in the new setting. But, yeah. I made all these works in here in England to try to re re reduce a bit of the carbon footprint because especially as a new program, um, there are funds that you can place either to production or to shipping. And if we could move things to shipping, that always helps. I mean, to production. I did that actually with my first show, museum show at the Perez. Uh, and it was actually a suggestion of another brilliant friend, Saya Wolfwalk, where I was, you know, talking to her on the subway saying, Saya, I was given this opportunity to do a show in Miami and I'm so excited, but I have no idea how I'm going to produce this show and ship it to Miami, given all that. And she's like, oh, just suggest to the curator that you move everything from shipping to production, and that way they pay for your studio in Miami. And it was the best gift, because the curator got to speak with me. We had a year-long conversation, and she was able to develop her program as I developed my own. So I recommend that, if possible.
I guess also just going off of the specificity of the past two shows, but with here as well, I mean, yeah, when you're working within certain limitations, we wanted you to come to Somerset so we could save on costs, but there were different ways that you've pushed the practice by moving on to aluminium. And then with the murals and the fire station as well, there were certain late motifs of the trees in Somerset. There's the neon, there are lots of bugs and leaves also stuck to these um, paintings, but it develops in a really nice way when you're kind of forced in a certain direction. There are discoveries for sure. It's all, it's the fun part of it. Um, I have a question. Thank you. Oh, I don't know if you can see me here. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, something I've noticed a lot in the work is using the plant-like to also feel like human bodies. And I see it a lot in the Siguapa work. Um, or even in the abstraction elements of like how you apply the paint, it feels very earth-like to me or like floral. Um, so I kind of wanted to hear more about this idea of using another living thing, like a plant, to reflect like the human body um, and how that kind of like shows up in your work. What, are you thinking about the body when you look at plants or like the opposite or like the inverse? Um, and also, and it's also for Alvaro because I see it in his work too, um, what ideas about the body come up when you use different materials and you're morphing them in to become like their own standstill? Because both your works to me feel like sculptures, like you were saying, like the painting is a sculpture. Um, so just like, yeah, so to wrap it up, just like ideas of like turning the plant like into human form and vice versa, and also just materiality and creating thought forms and bodies out of material. A kind of meandering quick one in the sense that um, there are, you know, being in the countryside here, noticing the beauty of thatched roofs and how it's such a specific lineage and tradition and a very, um, you have to have deep knowledge to be able to not just cultivate the materials, but to weave them in a certain way. And I wanted to give a bit of that feeling of these are living plants that will over time age and dry and become something else. So a weaving and a rustling when you go near them that I hope will get people's understanding of time as well. And certain things emit certain smells, the eucalyptus, the rosemary, like different materials will over time emit different activate the space differently. So um, just also understanding the beautiful confines of being human, how especially speaking of like beauty standards and about uh, the pressure of the world, how, you know, getting to appreciate like the full life cycle of something seems just gorgeous. So to be able to center that in a space seems urgent. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I just thought of a story that I always say. You know, my grandma used to say, never be ashamed of what the Lord makes your body do. And then she would go and do what the Lord made her body do right in front of us. And um, I just think, you know, the, the wisdom of that is that you're going to age, your body's going to age, it's going to do things that you will have to get accustomed to. And the great part about being a maker um, is that you m make with a kind of vigor um, that your body can do when you're as you age and so like probably the most brilliant water lilies are made i mean paintings are made by monet as his eyesight is going away and that's because his body is doing what his body is doing and i think we are um it's really important i guess for me to um think through what my body is doing, not be ashamed of it, be okay with whatever kind of thing that, like, ah! you know, oh, there's great, okay, you know, so any type of stuff, and uh, and just make work without shame, you know, and you know, my grandma was a gangster, but she was right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but on a on a different kind of also geeky way of thinking about it, I had just been seeing these painting tradi- traditions in Japan where it was like a Buddhist meditation on death, and they would, you know, it was a tradition that started in India and China, that would just be like it could be a man and a woman's body, and they would go through the painting through the full cycle of like the beautiful self then like decomposing and becoming the earth and then growing up as a tree again. Um, And in Japan, it kind of became a slightly more misogynist. It was like the vain maiden rotting away and then becoming the worms and then coming back as a beautiful cherry blossom tree. So just this idea of how that meditation is valuable and how in certain, certain lenses can flip it in a certain way, but it doesn't take away the core of it. So I wanted to have enough in a light way, that feeling through the plant life. Yeah. Thank you both for those answers. I think we have time for one more question. I can go, but I can give it to someone else if you want. Uh, Philly, I wanted to know about how you feel after, because it's so immersive, it's so sensorial, there's so much detail, there's so much thinking. Once this is done, how internally, because it's almost so protective, how do you feel after? A little bit like when an actor stops a role that they've been doing for so long. How do you feel empty? Do you feel rejuvenated? How do you feel? So I like to say that artists are almost like we're fountain taps for the muses. And if you are um, at your best self, you're ready to listen and you're ready to express it. So that's my only job, is just to make myself as capable as possible to express. And so what's exciting for me, as beautiful as this all is, it is something that is then like past me. And it is wonderful to hear stories years later of people who experience it with me, especially for for ephemeral installations like this, where they'll be like, this, what they loved about it is what remains, it's what's real. But I'm just excited to be able to express. So I'm, I'm waiting for the next expression. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.